That song we just sang, you know, we sing songs, we preach sermons. I want to talk to you tonight about the believer's authority. The believer's authority. This is part one of a series I'm going to do. The believer's authority. I want to direct your attention to Ephesians chapter 1. Most believers do not know that God has given them authority as a believer. They don't know the authority that they have. And instead of, instead of praying winning prayers and walking in the power and the anointing of God, they just pray a very passive prayer. They really are not prayer warriors. If there's one thing I've ever sought to do, it is to make you a prayer warrior. Prayer is more caught, caught than taught. So if you ever come, if you'll come around these prayer meetings, I guarantee you, you'll catch the spirit of prayer that's on me. There's a spirit of prayer that's on me. Have you ever noticed there's a spirit of praise on me? Just like there's a spirit of praise on me, there's a spirit of prayer. I walk in that constantly. But instead of praying winning prayers, most believers, they pray very passive prayers. They continue to petition God, asking God for deliverance from sickness and disease. They don't understand that God has given them authority. The authority has been given to the church. And it's up to them, it's up to you and it's up to me to pray the prayer of faith that heals the sick. It's always in order to ask God to help you. Jesus said, ask you shall receive, seek you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. But people are always praying like this and I get emails from people and they're pitiful. Lord, Get the devil off my back. Lord, tell the devil to stop. That doesn't do you any good to pray like that. They fail to realize what the Bible says. The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, the Lord put the responsibility on the believer to resist the devil. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you authority to cast the devil out in my name. Jesus said, I'm going to give my church authority to heal the sick in my name. And some people, they ask God to prosper them and say, God, give me money. And they fail to realize that God has given us the power to get wealth. It is our responsibility to work and to use the gifts and the talents that God has given us. This is so far on what I'm preaching to where the church walks today, you can probably think that I've gone off the deep end. But I got Bible for everything I preach out of this pulpit. And I've been walking in this authority since the Holy Ghost revealed it to me many years ago. The church has been given authority. And we need to learn how to use that. Our combat with the devil should be with an attitude of confidence. Because we have authority and God always wants us to triumph in Christ. When you can pray like this, thank you Lord, you always cause me to triumph. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Thanks be unto God, which always giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. No weapon formed against me shall not, not ever prosper. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. How is the Spirit going to lift up a standard in the grace of, of uh, <coughs> dispensation of grace? He's going to do that as you open your mouth, pray in the Holy Ghost, use the name of Jesus, and exercise the authority God has given you. The devil does not want the Christian to learn about the authority that they have. So some of you will probably go out of here and say stuff about me like you do that you think I don't know you're saying, and it's always getting back to me. But the devil will fight you. He does not want you to realize the authority that you have. So you can say, well, Pastor Nelson, you know he's wrong. No, I'm not wrong. I'm walking in it. I want the church to walk in it. The devil will fight you on this subject because once you recognize who you are in Christ, hell has to recognize who you are. You've heard me preach it. The devil does not have to recognize who you are until you know who you are and your position in Christ. Let me give you some scripture, Ephesians 1 and 3. Look at this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us Look at this. What does he bless us with? With all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places because we are in Christ. God, our heavenly Father, has blessed the entire church, not just the ch chosen few, 
with every spiritual blessing. That means every spiritual blessing that exists in this Bible, it belongs to you. Amen. It belongs to us. That means that authority belongs to us because it belongs to Jesus Christ. And as a child of God, it belongs to you and to me. We are chosen. God chose us. Jesus chose to leave a church here. He said, the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do because I'm going to my Father. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost on my church. When the Holy Ghost comes, he's going to empower you. He's going to teach you. He's going to give you revelation. He's going to show you things to come. And in my name, you are to do what I was doing on this planet. I'm seated at the right hand of the Father. You're seated with me. I'm here on earth in you, and you're here on earth. So you're the light. You're the salt. Be about the Father's business like I was. Get busy. Go out and change the world around you. I want to talk to you about the Believer's Authority, Part 1. Father, thank you so much for the precious Word of God. Roll the curtain back tonight, Lord, from our spiritual eyes. Let us see clearly what Paul is talking about. Take us from faith to faith, from victory to victory, from revelation to revelation, so we may know who we are and what belongs to us as a child of God. The entire church may rise up in great power and great glory. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The believer's authority is unveiled more fully in the book of Ephesians than in any other book in the Bible. I did an entire series. I don't do much preaching line by line, exegesis preaching, but I did an entire series on the book of Ephesians. There are spiritual anointed prayers in the first and in the third chapter of this epistle that uh, we should pray. When we pray these prayers, we are praying the same prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed. Now, I want you to look at these prayers because they are powerful. And the same thing that belonged, that Paul prayed for that church age, it belongs to the church age, every church age, okay? Jesus gave the model prayer to his disciples. And the Holy Ghost gave these prayers. I'll say that again. God gave me that. Jesus gave the model prayers to his disciples. And the Holy Ghost gave these prayers to Paul so Paul could share these prayers in his epistles. There's another prayer in Colossians, but we're talking on the book of Ephesians mostly tonight, okay? But look at Ephesians 116. Paul is speaking, and he said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Now, yours is not going to read like mine, because I, I made a change on your sheet, okay? So you need to look at the screen right now. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, and what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, to you and to me, the exceeding greatness of his power, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, the same power that's working in Jesus, God says, I want you to understand that power so that same power can work in you, Okay. Verse 20, which was wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So God raised Jesus from the dead, set him at his own right hand. The right hand is the hand of authority. That's why Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The right hand, most people are right-handed. The right hand exercises authority. I got a nice jab, but I tell you what. I got a punch that will put your lights out with my right hand. Yeah, that's the hand of authority where I'm concerned. Never did like to play with left-handers because everything's odd and it's backwards. But, you know, most people are right-handed. and they have Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father with authority and power. So don't think I'm getting carnal. I just want to give you an example, okay? The right hand of authority. Now I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 3. These are two prayers prayed in Ephesians. Ephesians 3 and 14. Paul said, For this cause 
I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven is earth is named, that he would grant you. I changed your, your hand out there. He would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of God which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Now, for many years, we Pentecostal, we had thought, because they speak in tongues, they're full of the Holy Ghost. No, that's just the initial evidence that you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, there'll be signs and wonders following you. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, you'll be able to lay hands on the sick. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, you cast out devils wherever you go. You take authority because you have the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to do these things, okay? So, I've been praying these prayers that I handed you for more than 10 years, probably 15. I don't know how long, but I used to carry them in my Bible, and I prayed them so long. And here's how I've been praying the prayers, and I've given you a copy so you can pray these prayers in the first person. Instead of praying that the Father may give unto you, as Paul did, he was praying for the church, the spirit of wisdom. I put it like this. I'm praying in the first person that the Father may give unto me the spirit of wisdom. I want you to have it. And Paul was saying, I want you to have what I got. That's what he's saying. But see, Paul had the revelation. And so Paul is talking to the church and saying, I want you to have it. And so I put it in the first person like this. If, Father, according to Ephesians 1, 16 to 23, you have given me the spirit of wisdom and revelation of Jesus Christ, that the eyes of my understanding may be enlightened to know what is the hope of your calling and the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. Thank you that you are revealing to me the exceeding greatness of your power, which was wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at your own right hand. Now, I have been praying that for 10 plus years using first person. I'm saying, God, I don't understand it. I prayed it so long that I memorized it. Look at Ephesians uh, three fourteen. Father, I pray that you would grant me according to the riches of your glory to be strengthened with might by your spirit in my in a man, that Christ may dwell in my heart by faith, that I, being rooted and grounded in love, may, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height, and to know the love of God, which Christ, which passes knowledge, that I might be filled with all the fullness of God. I praise you, Lord, that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all I could ever ask according to the power that's working in me. And for a long time, I just thought that was the power of the Holy Ghost. But going back, studying these prayers, God has revealed this to me. The power that's working in us is the power of God's love. The power that's working in us is the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. I know this sounds foreign, but it's right out of the book. <laughs> and we, it's the power of the Spirit. So it's the love of God, it's the power of the Spirit, and it's the power of Christ's faith that's working. It's the power of his love, the power of faith, and the power of his Spirit. That's the power that is working in the church. This is a revelation. Now, I made these prayers very personal. I want you to look at Colossians uh, 1, 9 through 11. This is the other prayer that Paul prays. If you'll read his epistles, there are three prayers. If you find another one, please tell me, because I've been looking for it for years. This is the third prayer. Father, according to Colossians 1, 9 through 11, I pray that you will fill me with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Sounds sort of like what he's praying in Ephesians 1, doesn't it? That I might walk worthy of you unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, 
and increasing in the knowledge of you, strengthened with all might according to your glorious power, under all patience with long suffering with joyfulness. Under God be glory through the church, in the church throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. We must have the spirit of wisdom and revelation of Christ if we're going to grow in grace and knowledge. I'll say that again. We must have the spirit of knowledge. We must have revelation if we're going to grow. If you just come and listen to me preach and you don't get a hold of this, if you don't memorize scripture, you're never going to walk in what I'm preaching. But I am here to equip you. That is my job. My job is to equip you, to teach you, to empower you through what the Holy Ghost has given to me so that you can go out and do the work of an evangelist. So you can go out and be the light. So you can go out and heal the sick. So you can go out and win the lost. So you can go out like they did in the early church, full of power, full of revelation, full of anointing, full of Jesus, and turn your world upside down. The churches miss this. They want to come to church and sing a few songs and dance a little while. I'm all for the dance, but I'll tell you, at the end of the day, when I face the devil, I'm ready to put him where he belongs under my feet. When I get sick, I'm on my way to getting healed. When I see others sick, I'm praying, God, help me to get a revelation. Speak one word to me so I can go lay hands on them or speak to somebody. When I was sick, I said, God, you can heal me. Uh, any way you want to. I wish you would just take somebody that had a sign gift, God, of healing, and they'd come up to me and say, Thus saith the Lord, Jerry, God's going to heal you now when I lay my hands on you. It didn't happen that way. God was working my faith. People were praying for me. I was praying for me. I mean, I prayed and I prayed and I was quoting scripture, quoting scripture, quoting scripture. But I told the devil, I said, I'm going to tell you something. You have no authority over me. I will not leave this planet until Jesus Christ is through with me. I will not leave this planet until God calls me home. I am here on an assignment, and I will fulfill my assignment in Jesus' name. And when God is through with me, that's when I'll go home. So many people, they're afraid of the devil. You don't have to be afraid of the devil. You are in his kingdom. God translated you out of his kingdom, out of the power, that word is exosia, the authority of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. You need to be able to talk like that. I mean, you need to be able to rattle scriptures off and be able to put the devil where he belongs, and that's under your feet. The devil does not want you to understand the authority that you have. He wants you running to other people saying, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. I don't mind praying for other people. But I told my wife today, I said, if I could get that one person right there to understand authority, if they could just rise up, they would not have to always be crying like a little baby. You know, been in the church for years and years and years, still sucking a bottle. Paul said, I couldn't feed you with meat. Said, I had to give you milk. Said, you're still on the bottle. You should be ready to eat the meat of God's word, but I have to feed you and nurse you like a little baby. The church is like that today. I hate to say it, but God help us to grow up, okay? Most Christians do not realize that there's a spiritual war going on. They do not realize it. And they live their lives thinking that all of their problems are caused by people. Soon as somebody does something against me, you know what I do? I go to work on the devil. I say, God, they can do whatever they want to me, and when you get ready to whip them, it's up to you. You whip them real good. Vengeance belongs to you. I'm going to walk in happiness. My, my happiness is not in their head. My happiness is in Jesus. And God, they're your child. God's got some children. I tell you, some of them need to grow up. He's got some children that they're sort of weird. He's got some weird children, but they are his children. I said they are his children. They're his children, and God knows how to straighten them out. So I, I tell people, I say, you can mess with me all you want to, but don't put your hand on me because I won't mess with you, and God will whip you real good because I'm not going to mess with you. I'm going to love you because faith works by love, and I'm not going to let anybody in the body of Christ keep my faith from working. 
This thing's between me and Jesus. He's the author of my faith. He's the finisher of my faith. And he had to suffer through some things. And I said, praise God, Lord, if I've got to suffer through some things, Paul had to suffer for the name of Jesus. And if you are going to walk in authority, guess what? You are going to suffer for the name of Jesus. And a lot of it will come from inside the church. That's free. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Look at this. Our problem is a spiritual problem. And it takes spiritual weapons to win the battle of life. I'll say that again. Our problems are spiritual problems. And it takes spiritual weapons to win the problems of life. Look at Ephesians 6 and 12. Paul said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. All right. I want to give you some good scripture from what I'm saying. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness. King James says in high places. If you're reading a new King James, personally, it says in heavenly places. Other translation, so, some people, they, they think that, you, you know, when the translators didn't make any mistakes. They did. They made a, a lot of mistakes. When, when Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents, scorpions. Put Luke 10, 19 up there, please. Behold, I give unto you power. I've said this so many times. That word is exosia. It means authority. When Jesus said that, he said, I'm giving you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions over all the power of the dunamis of the enemy. He said you were translated out of one kingdom into the kingdom of darkness, the power of darkness into his kingdom. That word is exosia. You and I were under the authority of the devil. If you ever get that straight, you were under his authority. You didn't just sin because you, you were mean. You sinned, and I sinned because we had a sin nature. It was just our nature to sin. And, and some Christians are mean as a junkyard dog. Amen. They gossip and talk about you. Amen. They're just as mean as a junkyard dog. And they don't realize what they're doing. Amen. I, I'm, I'm preaching real good now. <laughs> Hallelujah. But your battle is not with flesh and blood. Your battle is with principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. We're on planet earth. We're in, right over us is the canopy of first heaven. Second heaven is between us and God. God resides in third heaven. He sits in the sides of the north. Paul was caught up in the third heaven. The devil rules his kingdom. He's not in hell like some people think. He rules his kingdom from the heavenless. And when you start praying, he's trying to stop your prayers from penetrating into heaven. Some people say, well, you don't, they don't have to get to heaven. Well, that's why you have to persevere in prayer. They do have to get to heaven. You've got to pray Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. That means you bound the devil in second heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. It means it's been loosed in third heaven because you have the authority to loose things. I hope the church can get this. Amen. Many of the healings that Jesus did, they were spiritual healings. We're talking about a warfare. He cast a spirit of deafness out of a person. They were instantly delivered. He cast the spirit of dumbness out of some people, and they instantly spake. He realized, and I'll give you some scripture, that he was fighting a spiritual warfare. He cast the fever out of Peter's mother-in-law. She was healed and got up and ministered to the Lord. He rebuked the fever. It was a spirit that made her sick. That spirit heard him. That spirit obeyed him. That spirit left her. She was instantly healed, and she got up and cooked some supper for the Lord. Amen. The woman who was bowed over for 18 years and could not stand up straight, Jesus cast a spirit out of her. She was bowed over. We call it arthritis. Cast the devil out of some people. Oh, I don't have a demon. You don't know what you got. If you're sick, many times I ask people, I say, can I pray for you the way I feel led to pray for you? And a lot of times these are Holy Ghost filled people, so I get permission because they don't think they can have a spirit. Well, the Holy Ghost, 
Your spirit man cannot be made sick by a demon, but I'm going to tell you, he can oppress your brain. The devil can. He can make your body sick until you realize uh, what you're up against. He can cause you problems. You have authority, but that does not mean there is not a warfare going on. You have authority to do this, but there's a war going on. Look at Luke 13, 6. Luke 13, 6. Jesus said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? It was a spirit. She couldn't straighten up. Jesus cast the devil out of her, and boom, she was instantly healed. Stick with me. I know this is sort of revolutionary. Okay, many times Jesus cast the spirit out of somebody to affect the spiritual healing. I'm going to give you some scripture. Luke 8, 16. It says, when the eve was come, they brought unto him many possessed with devils. Luke, you got that one? Matthew 8, 16. Matthew 8, 16. This, this is the occasion where... Um, he heals all the people so it would be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bowed sickness. He hadn't gone to the cross yet. So they bring him to Jesus. Jesus had been to Peter's mother-in-law. They find out that Jesus is there. This is the occasion. And so Jesus was tired. He wanted to go rest. He healed her because she was sick when he went in there. Cast the devil out of her, a spirit, a fever. It heard Jesus. It obeyed him. It left her. She got up and she ministered to the Lord. Now, Luke, Matthew 8, 16 says, When the eve was come, they brought unto him, unto Jesus, many that were possessed with devils. They were possessed with that. He cast out the spirits with his words and healed all that was sick. Right? And then it goes on to say that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. He healed everybody he healed on the basis of what Isaiah the prophet had said 700 years before. And so Jesus is here. His time has come. It's his season. He cast the devil out, and he healed them. Now, let me give you a note. So we see Jesus cast the spirit out with his word. Here's another scripture that reveals how Jesus dealt with the spirit and then he healed the sick. Look at Acts 10, 38. Jesus dealt with the spirits, then he healed the sick. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, oppressed of the devil, oppressed of the devil, oppressed of the devil. Why? For God was with him. You're supposed to cast the devil out of people that are oppressed. Some people, they won't even come to the altar. I wonder how they think they're going to get delivered. Some people run out the back door. As soon as I finish preaching, I say, God, they took all that faith that I just preached, and they run out the back door with it. Never came to the altar, never prayed, never prayed for anybody. It's pitiful to me. I mean, this is a war. That's why it's pitiful to me. This is war. And if you ever get a militant spirit, the Bible says, Jesus said this, the violent take it by force. I'm a warrior. I'm a warrior, but I'm not going to war with you. My battle's not with you. My battle's with the devil. My battle's with principalities and powers. I, I'm in this thing to win. Amen. So we see that our battle is not with flesh and blood, but against the powers of darkness. But every sickness, I need to say this, is not a spiritual battle. Sometimes you, I, I'm afraid to teach some people on demons and deliverance because they think the devil's behind everything. Every bush. Every spirit, every, every sickness is not a spiritual battle. For instance, if you cut yourself and your finger gets infected, that was not a devil. The devil didn't cut your finger. You cut your finger. But always remember this. The devil moves in on weakness. And anywhere you leave an open door for him, 
he will come in. He moves in on weakness. And anywhere you leave an open door, the devil will come in. The cut was something that happened in the natural. But the infection can become demonic. And you've got to know that. Because the devil will move in if you let him. If he can find a place in your house, your body, he will move in. Jesus said, when the unclean spirit is cast out of the man, said he, he walks through dry places looking for seven spirits more evil than himself. He returns to that house. He found it fell, swept, and garnished. He returned into that house, and it was in a worse state than it was in the first time. So you better be putting some word in your heart. You better be getting some Holy Ghost inside of you because you are already in God's kingdom. You've already been translated out of the devil's kingdom. And if you don't learn how to fight, the devil will mess with your stuff. I said the devil will mess with you because you're no longer in his kingdom. You're in God's kingdom now. And every time you hold your hand up, he sees that your heart's been circumcised by the blood and the surgical tool of the Holy Ghost. And he knows that who you are. He just does not want you to know who you are. You are a child of God. You are a child of the Most High. You have been washed in the blood. You are free from sin. You are free from sickness. You are free from disease. You are supposed to prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. That's why everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. We are ours and join ours with Jesus Christ. Heaven belongs to us at the end of the journey, and the devil can't stop it if you'll stay connected to the true vine. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. It all belongs to you. See, if you break your leg, that's something in the natural. You need to get it set by a good doctor so it will heal properly. Because it's going to heal. Because God built healing into you. You see that finger right there? I broke it playing ball. I was losing my vision. And I refused to get glasses. I thought God was going to heal my eyes. They still heal. They just change shapes like my body has. Amen. I'm working on that too, Lord. But one day I prayed for a Mexican migrant worker, and his, three of his fingers were broken. And my son was there, and he can testify to this. And that boy couldn't even bend his fingers. I said, what did the doctor say? He said he can't set them because they're swollen too much. I said, I'm going to pray for you. Let me pray for you. He said, yes, I will. I said, when I pray for you, the hand of Jesus is going to be under my hand. I laid my hand on him. I rebuked that thing. I said, be healed in Jesus' name. I said, now bend your fingers. How many times have I told people in this altar, lift those legs, bend over, do what you couldn't do, stretch forth that hand, exercise your faith, do something. I told him, I said, bend your fingers. And he took those broken fingers right between our eyes and started bending them like that. I said, bend them in Jesus' name. Bend them in Jesus' name. Bend them. I said, now open them up in Jesus' name. Ah, when he opened up, every bone was set. All the swelling was gone. He was healed instantly by the power of God. Jesus showed up and healed him. And my son watched every bit of it. I'm glad he saw that miracle. Amen. See, we, we are dealing with spirits. And we have authority through Jesus Christ. Our combat is with the devil. And we should be conscious of the authority that we have in Christ. The door to exercising authority pivots on two things. They aren't like two hinges. And Paul explains these two things in the book of Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 1.19. Paul said, I want you to understand what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, to you and me, who believe? It's right on the screen. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, who believe, according to the working of his mighty power? What was that power? Verse 20. The power which was wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Now, I want you to go to Ephesians 2 and 6 because this is the key to what Paul is saying. This is where you'll get revelation right here. If you can see this. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you'll open everyone's understanding. I pray that you'll open my understanding 
to even greater revelation as we look into this word, Lord. Ephesians 2 and 6. Paul said, I want you to understand what was wrought in Christ when God raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Now look at Ephesians 2 and 6. And has raised us up together. Do you see that? He raised Jesus from the dead. He has raised us up together and made us set together in heavenly places in Christ. Because you are in Christ, when he rose, praise God, you rose with him. When he was crucified, you were crucified with him. When he was buried, you were buried with him. When he was planted in that grave, you were planted with him. When he was raised, you were raised. When he ascended, you ascended with him. And when he sat down, look at that. God has raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. You're on this planet. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in heaven. You're in heaven, seated with him at the right hand of the Father with authority. I know this sounds weird, but it's true. See, you need to feed on those true truths right there. Go back and read Ephesians 1, 19 and 20 till you know it, know it, know it, and then read Ephesians 2 and 6. Feed on them until they become a part of your spirit man, not your head, until they get into your spirit to where you know, devil, you're under my foot. I'm in Christ. I'm the body. He's the head. You're under his feet. And I'm the body, and you're under my feet. If all I am is a little toe, you're under my foot. Glory to God. You got to know that because this will give you the confidence to cast the devil out and to walk in victory. God wants us to understand the greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power that was wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Not only did he raise him from the dead, But when he did, he set him at his own right hand. The right hand, as I said earlier, is the hand of authority. Jesus is seated in heaven at the Father's right hand, and here's the mystery. It's a mystery. Paul talks about mysteries. The mystery. If the devils had known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What is that mystery, Paul? Colossians 1, 27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, Jesus is seated in heaven at the Father's right hand, and we are seated together with him in heavenly places at the Father's right hand, and that gives us spiritual authority. God has raised him up, and he has raised us up together with him, and he has seated us with him in heavenly places. Look at Ephesians 2 and 6 again. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. When Christ was raised, we were raised. When he sat down, we sat down. It's the same principle that's found in Romans chapter 6. I'm going to go pick up another of Paul's letters because I want you to see that what I'm saying is right out of the Word of God. It's right out of the Bible. I have memorized these scriptures. I have studied them for years. I'm trying to understand my position in Christ, to understand the mysteries. Paul is the only author in the New Testament that unveils who we are in Christ. He even had the audacity to say, my gospel. He does. He said that I may preach my gospel. Well, it's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but the man was caught up in the third heaven. He said, I was shown revelation that it's not even lawful that I write it. Thank God for what he gave us. I said, Lord, I wish I could get a hold of what he gave us. Maybe I could, <laughs> you know, we want to know more than, than he knew. I don't think we're going to get that. No. He was a special chosen vessel caught up in the third heaven. So if you want to know, come hear me preach because I preach it. If you want to know, go to Bible school and, and, and get, get a good Holy Ghost Bible school teacher and you'll learn something. Amen. Don't try to get caught up in the third heaven. That probably won't work for you. Look at this principle, Romans 6 and 3. Paul said, know you not. Now, I want you to watch this. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When you were baptized, when, actually before water baptism, when you got saved, The Spirit of God baptized you into Christ Jesus. Then Jesus comes along and baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. And 
the preacher, I baptize you in water and others baptize you in water. So there's one baptism of the spirit. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. This is Paul's revelation. The preacher baptizes people in water in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, showing that they're an outward expression of an inward work that's already taken place. And, and Jesus, when you get saved, uh, Brother Carl, uh, no, uh, Brother Robert, he got saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Boom, boom, boom. We haven't baptized him in water yet. I don't know if he's been water baptized or not. But see, the mystery is this. God baptizes us into Christ's death. Okay? Look at verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism unto death. So you were buried with Christ. Okay? That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, you were raised. Why? So that you could walk in the newness of life. This is a lot of scripture, but this is the revelation. You won't get it. Unless you really study and ask the Spirit and pray and pray and pray and fast and say, God, show me these mysteries. Look at verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. You've already got resurrection power in you. That's why I dance. Woo! I can't tell you how sometimes... You know, I'm just down like everybody else. And I get up here and I start preaching. Man, I have to go home. I can't even go to sleep. I'm as high as a Georgia pine. I get so full of God and so full of the Holy Ghost and those scriptures just running over and over and over and over in me. That's why I gave you that hand out. Read that thing. Dear God, look at, look at, at, at just, just read those first things. You know, uh, Father, we're not going to forget any of your benefits. I wrote that. I'm hand feeding you. I said I'm hand feeding you. I said again, I'm hand feeding you. So you can get it. It's not enough for a few people to have it. God wants you to have it. It's my responsibility to teach it if I understand it. And I got some revelation on it. I asked Brother Philip Pearson, I said, I wished I had somebody I could go and sit down and listen to them tell me about the gifts of the Spirit. Not that I know it all, but I don't know a whole lot of people I can go and sit and say, teach me. When I'm talking about spiritual things. They're more interested in church growth and growing a big church and having a big name in the community than they are in walking in the power of the Spirit of God with authority, healing the sick, casting out devils, and establishing the kingdom. I'm not sure about some people in the church. I'm sure about some people, though. Some people didn't get what I got. I wonder about them. I'll say that again. I wonder about them. How much do you love God? How much do you love His church? How much you love God? How much you love His Word? How much you love God? How much you love His people? That's how much you love God. I said that's, how, that's good preaching. That's real good preaching. I mean, that's excellent preaching. So stop talking, running the church down, get your priorities right, and talk about Jesus, and tell somebody you need to be saved. You wonder why your children don't want to come to church? You wonder why your grandchildren don't want? Because you run the preacher down. You run the music down. You run the church down. You ought to build up the church. And you ought to pray for the church. Yeah. Woo! Glory to God. Yeah. Glory. Glory. Yeah. Glory. You think it doesn't get back to me? I still love you. I just decided to love you. Why don't you build up the brothers and sisters in the church instead of gossiping and backbiting? I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the devil. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. The devil needs to hear it. He can't stop me. There's only one person that can stop me, and that's God my Father. I'm on a mission. Hallelujah. Woo! Let me move on with this thing. So we're buried with baptism unto death. We're raised with him by the glory of God the Father. We've been planted together in the likeness of his death. We've been raised in the newness of life. 
And we have been seated with him in heavenly places in Christ. All authority that was given to Christ belongs to us, and we need to exercise it. Jesus is the head of the church. We are his body. We are to carry out his work here on earth. And the fact is, Christ cannot do his work upon this earth without our help. Boy, I just lost 10 of you right there. <laughs> Jesus Christ cannot do his work on this earth without us. He's not coming again until he comes to set up his kingdom. He's not going to send angels to preach the gospel. He's not going to send angels. He does at times. They walk through walls and they, they heal people. But somebody prayed for that person. God moves through his body, the church. The church is a triumphant, victorious church. At least some of it is. Hallelujah. We cannot do his work without him. He cannot do his work without us. Some people say, well, God can get along without me, but I need him. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We need him, but he needs us. He needs us to carry out his work on this earth. That's why he left those 12 disciples. That's why 120 of them were waiting in the upper room, waiting for the descent of the Holy Ghost, because a church was going to be born, and that church was to take his word and take his light and take the gospel to the whole world so that all could be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. We need him, but he also needs us to carry out his work. His, this is the truth that Paul is preaching about. Christ is the head of the church. We are his body. Your head needs your body. And your body needs your head. You need your hands and your feet. You need your eyes and your ears. Your body needs your head. And your head needs your body. And likewise, spiritually speaking, the head Christ, he needs the body, the church, to carry out his work. And the body needs the head to carry out his work. His work will never be done without the church. And the church will never do his work without him. Paul said, God forbid that I should preach anything other than Christ." And crucified, and raised, planted, and seated. See, his work will never be done without the church. And the church can never do his work without him. Not only is Christ seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all principality and power, we are there too. Because God has made us to sit together with him. And so, in our battle against the enemy... We need to keep this in mind. We are seated above them. We have authority over them. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ. No matter what kind of battle you're fighting in the spirit world, you are already above the devil. He is beneath your feet. He does not want you to know your authority. And it's my mission to teach it. And I love to teach it. And you'll get a lot more of it. We are seated above them. We have authority. The Lord's victory belongs to us. And we are to carry it out. The Lord's victory belongs to us. Jesus defeated the devil. He's a defeated foe. In World War II, we defeated Japan. We dropped them to their knees. When we dropped those bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki... Boom, that was it. They were defeated. And we sent an occupying army over there to occupy Japan, and we rebuilt that whole nation. We are the occupying army. Jesus said, occupy till I come. The works that I did shall you do also, and greater works. He said, I'll give you authority in my name to cast out devils, to heal the sick, I, I give you the power to get wealth. Go to work. Do something. God works when we work. Not one time in the New Testament is the believer ever told to pray 
that God the Father or Jesus the Lord would do anything against the devil. Not one time. Not one time. You are wasting your time if you pray and ask God to make the devil stop or make the devil go away. You're just wasting your time. The believer is told to do something about the devil. I know I lost 10 people when I said that. The believer is told to do something about the devil. The church has been given the authority in the name of Jesus. And we're to do something about the devil. And we're to exercise the authority that has been given to us. If the believer didn't have authority, Jesus would not have told us to cast out devils in his name. If the believer didn't have authority, Jesus would not have told us to heal the sick in his name. But thank God we have it. The authority is yours. Whether you feel like it or not, authority has nothing to do with your feelings. It has everything to do with your knowledge of God and the knowledge of your position in Christ. Start the music, please. Authority has nothing to do with your feelings. It has everything to do with revelation. That's why I gave you that prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll give me the spirit of wisdom, the revelation of the knowledge. Open my eyes, Lord. Enlighten me. Pray those prayers. Don't, don't just take that thing and ball it up and throw it in the trash can. You want your life radically changed? Take it. Pray it. Ask the Holy Ghost to open your eyes. Let us come to the altar. Authority is yours, but you must exercise it. Let's pray. Thank you all for praying for Sister Judy. It was wonderful to hear her on the phone today. Thou, O oh Lord. Nicholas, play that song that you. Just go and play that till he gets his guitar. I want you to play that song on authority you were singing. Father, in Jesus' name, we're fasting. We're praying. And Lord, we're praying that you will open our eyes. Lord, thank you so much for speaking to me. Lord, on how the church prayed and Peter was delivered. And Lord, we did the very same thing. And Sister Judy Watson, Lord, she felt her church's prayers. She felt the prayers, Lord. She told me, she said, I felt the prayers of that church praying for me. The effectual Fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Father, we love you and we praise you. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Pastor Nick, sing that song on authority. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father's love. Open our eyes, Lord. Lord, we love you. To die, poured out for all mankind. Lord, thank you so much. We're praying for this great nation, Lord. Lord, we're rotting at the core. Lord, we have forgotten you at the place of fullness. And the church he must rise up in authority. Lord, we cannot win by fighting flesh and blood. Our weapons are mighty through God. Our weapons are prayer. Our weapons are the Word. Our weapons are the blood. Our weapons are the Holy Ghost. Our weapons, Lord, they're mighty through God. Hallelujah. Glory. All authority, Lord. Every victory is yours. You give authority to your church. Glory. Every victory yes, Lord. is yours, Lord. And it's ours. Everything you have belongs to us. Oh, 
overcome it the world, even our faith. Our faith is in you, Lord. Our faith is in the power that was wrought in you when the Father raised you from the dead and set you in heavenly places and seated us there in you. For you overcame. Power in hand, speaking the Father's plan, sending us out. Yes, Father, light in this room. We pray for this nation, Lord. Lord, we pray for our president. Lord, we pray for that Congress, that House. Lord, in this nuclear deal that's going down. Feels like, Lord, we've given up more than we're getting. Lord, we need some, we need a balance. Lord, we pray that in the name of Jesus, we bind that thing. Lord, let the church rise up. Lord, we need to secure our borders. We pray, God, that we'll get some people with some spine that'll stand up and secure our borders, God. We're in perilous times. God, our nation is vulnerable. Said that in the last days there would be perilous times. People departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And Lord, we got doctrines of devils.